the biggest single change we're seeing in, especially in multifamily for larger projects is a move away from traditional lumber uh, to a mass timber assembly. So uh, we have several of those projects in design and construction here in Wisconsin and in the South. Welcome to Buzz House, a Baker Tilly podcast where you can find all the buzz around multifamily housing. I'm Don Bernards, the partner in charge of Baker Tilly's multifamily housing practice. And I'm Garrett Gibson, a partner at Baker Tilly, also specializing in consulting on multifamily housing transactions across the country. Each week, we'll bring you a guest or a topic in the multifamily housing industry that will help you win now and anticipate tomorrow. Let's get started. Today, our guest in the Buzz House is Jason Korb, who is the principal of Korb and Associates Architects, which is a full service architecture and interior design firm located in Milwaukee, Wisconsin and working throughout the Midwest. We'll be talking with Jason today about current trends in architecture for multifamily, some inspired by COVID, others by a rise in costs, so just, just general other trends. We're very much looking forward to that discussion. Before jumping into that discussion with Jason, I wanna give you a few updates from around the industry. Many of you may have seen and heard the Federal Housing Finance Agency announced the 2020 allocations for the Housing Trust Fund, as well as the Capital Magnet Funds. Out of the total of one little over $1 billion for affordable housing, housing trust funds will receive $711 million, which is a $326 million um, uh, increase. Kind of very exciting about that. And uh, capital magnet funds will receive $383 million over, over double, an increase of $175 million from the prior year. Or so uh, these disbursements, as just noted, double the previous year's allocations. And the statewide uh, formula for housing trust funds will be uh, released very soon. So very exciting, very consistent with many programs. A lot of those are profits from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And so as those numbers are up, these allocations are, are higher. So very exciting. Again, housing trust funds and capital magnet funds double the allocation from the prior year. Uh, switching gears, our last podcast, we talked about some specific states uh, who currently have some form of draft legislation for state loan income housing tax credits. Again, another source we're seeing many states. And just confirming, here's kind of the complete list of states that are considering state credits right now in various forms of legislation. Montana, Arizona, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, Mississippi, and Maryland. And in addition to that, Wisconsin is currently, uh, which has a state loan housing tax credit program, is considering a state workforce housing credit program, which would be targeting those AMIs from 61% to 100%. So a lot of, just a lot of uh, proposed legislation around there. Again, just more resources for affordable housing. Lastly, as many of you have been following with the uh, American Rescue Plan Act or the latest COVID relief bill, uh, a lot, again, going to housing, uh, a lot going to rental assistance, $27.4 billion for rental housing assistance, $5 billion for people experiencing homelessness, and kind of another big thing, uh, $1,400 individual stimulus checks. Again, they, they, it is phased out at, at certain income levels and so forth. So, so again, the big, the big take home for housing on, on the, uh, this COVID relief bill is the rental assistance. We talked a lot about rental assistance last time. We posted out, I think it was some 440 sources of rental assistance programs across the country in our last podcast. Also, we know what we'll be talking about, I think in in future podcasts is the infrastructure bill. I think that's some of the next legislation we'll see out of Washington. Now with that, Garrick and I will jump into our discussion with Jason. Uh, Garrick? Yeah, thanks, Don. Um, And thanks for that brief intro. I'm kind of excited to hear uh, some future developments on state credits in the states you mentioned, and hopefully in additional states, including my home state of Texas. Uh, Let's just go ahead and jump into our discussion now, though. So, Jason, thanks for being on here. Why don't you uh, start by telling our listeners a little bit about yourself and your firm? Thank you, Garrett. Thank you, uh, Don. Uh, My name is Jason Corp. I'm the principal architect at Corbin Associates Architects, which is located in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. A little bit of our history, founded the firm in the fall of 2006 with a partner, and we grew very rapidly from two people to 18 people just in time for the 2008 crash. We were very lucky. We weathered it better than most in our industry because it was not a recession in our industry. It was a depression. We had one bad year started to recover in 2012. My partner and I parted ways in 2015, and I'm now the sole owner. 
and we have since grown back to a size of about 20 people. We do all kinds of project types except for major healthcare. Thanks, Jason, for that introduction. So with the pandemic and more people working from home, are you seeing the size of units increasing or not? Also, are you seeing any other type of COVID-related design-inspired features? The specific unit type in the multifamily world where we're seeing the size increase become more common is in a one-bedroom apartment. We're seeing increasing numbers of units that are one bedroom plus a den when the den doubles as a home office for people that are working from home. And the other thing that we're seeing is a greater emphasis on touch-free features. So different types of elevator calls, door operators, and that sort of thing, tow operated devices in buildings and that sort of thing. Those are the two biggest things that we're seeing due to COVID. That's interesting. So what about, so obviously there might be some, some, some size increase there, but I know there was some popularity with before COVID with micro units. What are you seeing with micro units sort of post COVID now or during COVID and, and where do you see them going post COVID? We haven't done a great number of them, but we are seeing them scattered as maybe 5% of uh, large developments with certain clients of ours that do those. Um, one of our clients did the first, basically all micro unit building in Milwaukee. They're not doing that again, but we are for them designing buildings where again, maybe 5% of them are 400 square feet or less. So it, it's, still a, it's still a unit type that's being developed, but um, more sporadically right now. Jason, you know, a question that we get a lot of time when talking to our developer clients is, and it seems like it's every year, and, and this year is, is obviously probably even more uh, enhanced with, you know, everyone's lumber prices, right? Lumber prices, lumber prices, lumber prices. We've had some discussion, should, are, are we seeing any any project shift away from from wood framing to, you know, to, to gauge metal framing or, or other kind of major features because of certain costs? Are you seeing anything uh, maybe in the infrastructure or, or you know, as, as, as we see lumber prices continue to rise right now? We are, um, in fact, we took through a public hearing just yesterday a large development that started out as a wood frame building. And the cost of lumber is so high right now that my client elected to change it to a cold form steel frame building. The upside to that is we were able to add a floor to the building because it's a more robust construction type, but they are very close to each other right now. There is still a small premium for steel over lumber, even with the increased cost. Several contractors that I've spoken to both in the Midwest and in the South believe that the price of lumber will come back to earth by the third quarter of this year. And so hopefully this is a temporary spike. We've seen a number of very strange supply chain issues due to COVID. They were predicted a year ago. They hit us later than, than we thought. So for instance, doors are being rationed in 2021. We have projects where our, our contractors had to redesign them or, or retrofit them at the 11th hour to get because they couldn't get seven foot tall doors and they needed to re redo the walls around them to accommodate a six foot eight door. That was important because this was a low income housing tax credit project with very strict compliance dates that we needed to hit. So it, it caused some, some fairly panic induced moments. Let's put it that way. No, that's, that's, that's good information. Yeah. That's good to hear on the lumber. Hopefully that, that holds true uh, later, later this year. You know, another um, uh, question, again, you referenced local housing tax credits and, and a lot of those projects, you know, Jason, have a lot of requirements for energy or green features. But again, back to cost, is it the cost benefit relationship? And so I think probably, I'm, I guess, over your career as an architect, you've seen different energy features. Uh, what are you seeing in today's, you know, I don't call it a standard department, but what are you seeing people pursuing and, 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 and is it still something still cost prohibitive or what, what, what's, 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 what's hot there? The biggest growth area we've seen in sustainable design across all building types is in solar because the technology is improving at an almost exponential rate. Furthermore, there are a number of pretty powerful tax credits that you can apply for if you're implementing a solar design. So for instance, the, the building I referenced earlier, it will very likely have a solar array on its roof. Uh, will not be for power generation, it will be for 
uh, heating domestic hot water. So it, it cuts down on the load of the boilers and these buildings use a tremendous amount of water and, and especially this one because its only source of heating is hydronic heating in the floors. So solar, for instance, can provide a huge benefit. The other thing we're really, really starting to dive into now is the complete electrification of buildings. That is, if you think of making a building like a Tesla, that is, you remove any gas or any petrochemicals that come into the building because the electric heating and cooling technology is so much better. This is a trend that's already hitting, uh, as, as often happens here in the East Coast, coming from Europe, and we're starting to look at it here in the Midwest as well. Thanks, Jason. That's always music in my ears to hear how solar is being implemented in different ways. Um, I've worked on a couple of projects that and it was definitely beneficial. So, you know, other than energy type of things, you know, we have a lot of affordable housing that focuses on special needs. Are you adding a lot more around accessibility with these types of projects? Well, in the affordable housing here in Wisconsin, in any event, WIDA, which is our Housing and Economic Development Authority, does hold uh, stricter standards than the Americans with Disabilities Act, which we sort of view as the floor for accessibility, not the ceiling. Um, the other thing about affordable housing is often it's, it's designed specifically to help people with special needs and different people that are differently able need different features. So, so if you're designing for a building with people who are hearing impaired, for instance, your technology and your systems for communication are visual based. And likewise, for, for people who are sight impaired, the systems that you put into a building are you know, geared towards the audio. So it's really dependent on the population you're trying to serve. Understandable, understandable. So well then, well then let, I guess shifting gears, what do you, or how do you anticipate any sort of changes or shifts in material choice in construction, how do you feel that that might impact project price or performance in, in the long term? Biggest single change we're seeing in, especially in multifamily for larger projects is a move away from traditional lumber uh, to a mass timber assembly. So uh, we have several of those projects in design and construction here in Wisconsin and in the South. The beauty of mass timber is it is very sustainable if it comes from a sustainable forest, a sustainably managed forest, I should say, and it is a carbon sink. So, for instance, we have a project in Milwaukee that is the equivalent or will sequester the amount of carbon dioxide that is the equivalent of taking 2,400 cars off the road for a year. And as long as that building is standing, that carbon is sequestered. The other thing we're pursuing in new technology, again, is related to carbon, is uh, carbon neutral or carbon negative concrete. The production of concrete traditionally produces very large amounts of carbon dioxide. There are new processes being put into place right now that, again, can make concrete carbon neutral or perhaps even carbon negative, like as mass timber does. Those are the two biggest material changes we see. Interesting. Carbon-free concrete. I like the I like the sound of that. So so then actually so so having all these sort of shift in material changes and you know things that are that are being implemented to reduce the carbon footprint, et cetera, have you seen an increase or de a decrease in the number of potential projects either going forward or not going forward as a result of these cost changes or or as a result of maybe schedule changes related to these materials? Um, in other words, have have any timelines been affected by this? We started to see in multifamily, we, we had one project, major project go on hold because the lending climate seemed to want to tighten up a little bit near the end of 2016. But having said that, we've only seen, especially in multifamily over the last year, everything accelerating. So the only thing that's slowing down our projects are supply chain issues, but we are actually being encouraged to accelerate our schedules. So it's, we, we are somewhat surprised that the, the multifamily world is as strong as it is right now, but we'll take it. So. Yeah, no, understandable. We, we, we've discussed that internally too. It, it, it's quite amazing how, how strong that multifamily uh, market is. The, the other thing we've seen that I, that I wanted to mention was that we're seeing demand in, if Milwaukee, for instance, is a secondary market in, in the tertiary markets, 
a real demand for class A multifamily, which doesn't typically exist there, for example. And, and the, cities, the cities themselves have to provide usually um, some kind of financial incentive to make the economics work, generally in Wisconsin in the form of TIF. For example, we opened a 90-unit luxury building in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, which is a metro area of about 100,000. And it was tremendously successful. And in fact, they can't raise rents fast enough. So, And with that, we want to thank uh, Jason for joining the Buzz House today. A lot of really good information. And listeners, thank you for tuning in today. Thank you all. Thank you for listening to Buzz House. To receive a notification when new episodes are available, please subscribe to Buzz House, a Bakatilly podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. For additional resources around multifamily housing, check out bakertilly.com. And if you have a suggested topic, please send them to build at bakertilly.com. That's B-U-I-L-D at bakertilly.com.